So now what I'm doing is just setting up a replica set out of the GUI without going through the shell, well, a little bit of the shell, everyone likes a little bit of the shell. And, you know, I'm ready to just deploy a cluster which will have the stream loads in. Nothing too fancy, but all of it's automatic. So, what has this to do with APIs, right? Well, nothing much. Let's just go through this. So it'll set it up all for me. This is all running in my machine, both things. The server that puts up Ops Manager, which is a tool that kind of lets me automate all of it. Uh, the nodes that I'm running are running in my machine. So all these three set nodes here are running in my machine. And I'm going to do some fancy stuff with like downgrading the version, upgrading the version, adding members, all that. Now, this has nothing to do with APIs. But we do like a lot of APIs. In fact, we love APIs. A database without APIs is very boring, correct? Everyone knows that. Does anyone here use a, a, a database that doesn't have an API? Do you know what that means? Absolutely nothing. So an API always needs to have some kind of API, so make, even if it's just a you know, server browser. And we love them a lot. I'm going to explain you a little bit about what MongoDB is for the ones that are not so familiar with it. I'm going to talk about the MongoDB specific APIs, which ones are available, which ones are not. I'm going to talk to you about Box Manager and what we can do in terms of an API, REST API that it offers, and a couple of instructions around how to build APIs, especially how to build APIs with MongoDB. So my name is Noberto. I'm a technical evangelist from MongoDB. I live in Madrid. I live in Barcelona. If you don't know the Catalan, I'm just saying, well, good afternoon. I used to live here, so I know my ways around Barcelona. Uh, if you want to come, reach out to me, any questions or doubts or uh, any suggestions, please just use the typical uh, contacts or chats. So we do love APIs. Uh, APIs are here to make a lot of the heavy weight that we generally have to do by ourselves, and all this programmatically. And this is why we definitely need APIs. This is why we are here all today, to learn a little bit which kind of APIs are out there, how to build these APIs, and how to set it up so that we can just deploy them and, and make use of it. So a little bit of MongoDB. Here everyone knows MongoDB, right? Yes. Good. Here, who uses MongoDB in the daily basis? Not so many, but almost all of you. And you probably know that it's a documentary of the database, right? You also know that for sure that's open source, right? And you also know that it's general purpose, correct? It is general, general purpose because it has a lot of features. Mostly, you can pretty much do any kind of application in MongoDB. Obviously, there's no such thing as a, a one-size-fits-all, so there are things that MongoDB will be dropping at it, and things that probably can tweak it to MongoDB to use it properly. Now, one of the things that we really like is to give you the option to actually do whatever you want. Absolutely any kind of application. Okay, so that's the purpose of MongoDB. If there's something that we don't do that well, we're probably working on getting it better at doing that. And you probably already know that. And there's a couple of reasons why. There's JSON formats. Has anyone seen any JSON files today in any presentation? Kind of is the de facto right right? So in terms of APIs and, and intercommunication between applications, this is what we're mostly been, uh, looking at in business. It has a lot of other features like full text search, uh, rich query, secondary indexation, aggregation framework. All of this are here to help us build awesome applications. Oops. So as I was mentioning, you've seen a lot of these structures today, right? More of the left-hand side than actually the right-hand side. But this is kind of an analogy you can have. Like if you have a relation system that everyone here learned at school, right? Who here didn't learn how to use the grid table at whatever at school? Who did it? No one, right? Everyone learned that. SQL is the basis for us to get data out and get it in. But that way, at least from school, we all learn how to do it. That's a good, good set of good reasons why to use it. But nowadays, we need something more agile, something more JSON. 
We also need rich data structures. So you should know that MongoDB offers you all this set of features. So you don't have JSON, actually, you just you have JSON, which is much more rich data type format. Correct? Do you guys know why we need those rich data type formats at all? Is JSON enough for all of you? Is JSON the standard data format that is enough for everything that you want to do in your application? What if you want to build an application that deals with money? Does those, you know, numbers is specific enough or detailed enough to get all the numbers you can get? What about dates? Is strings good enough? What about binary uh, data structures? Do we need to store them, like images and so on? We, know it, we need all those things. This is why you can't just rely on JSON. You can rely on JSON to just transport things in between. But when you're storing information, when you're doing calculations over that data, you're probably going to need something much more correct, much more precise. And this is why we need extended rich data structures. Okay? So don't forget about one thing. JSON is awesome, but it's very simple. So if you are actually want to do a lot of computation with it, you need rich data types. JSON is not a problem. There's a lot of benefits around building stuff with documents. We all know that. You know, we can expand it, we can iterate over things, we can have a non-specific scheme at the beginning, and we can evolve, and iterate, all that, we can change it a lot. This is one of the reasons why people really tend to like that. And obviously, it's much more natural. If I show you this document here, everyone knows what it means, right? It is based on that very, very right? No one, if you guys know Twitter API, everyone knows here Twitter API, right? Who doesn't know Twitter API? You guys don't know? So, Twitter offers you a uh, fire hosing API or a stream API where you can plug into Twitter to get, I don't know, data from what users are saying, how they are related to each other, which friends and which list they can post, all those things. And those are all JSON structures. Okay. Those JSON structures, no one needs to tell you what those fields are because they will tell you first name, last name, the day, whatever. It's, it's Self-explanatory. This is the biggest advantage of pretty much XML and JSON. So basically, it allows us to develop much quicker. You can have multiple schemas. Everyone knows this, correct? So far? Okay. Cheer up, dudes. I yeah, know it's just, you know, food is still upset. And we're still a kind of a a lot of talks in the morning, I'm still processing and food and, and information. Yeah, but pop it up. So we do have a couple of APIs. Um, and why do we need APIs and why are those important? Three main reasons in my opinion. To integrate data in services. Nowadays everyone is building their own REST API because they want to expose what they sell and what they do to other services. But they also want to consume other systems, like everyone plugs into Facebook API, even if it's just for AI, authorization, authentication, right? No one wants to deal with users anymore. No one wants to be hacked. Let Google and Facebook and all those guys get hacked, and we would just, you know, connect and plug it in so we can get all the authentication systems that we need. We don't want to deal with, you know, invalidation of passwords, we don't want to be, deal with bad entities. There are services that we can plug in that will handle that for us. And OAuth is one of the platforms that allows us to do it. If the service provides that, we just can build our application without taking care of it. Okay. Then we can steal that information from Facebook and Google and build all of our own profiles. That's why we need to do that. We also need to scale most of our systems. On my machine, it always runs, correct? But when all of a sudden I sell my service, I don't know, Telefonica, for example, and then immediately have access to all of their users, I need to be able to have an API that can be scaled. And most of our systems nowadays are built on top of infrastructure that can scale, like Amazon, like ODB, like services that I can deploy and scale up as much as I can. But also, the fact that I have a REST API or a HTTP bounded API, I can multiply the number of servers that I have for my API and can scale that very quickly. And the important one for me is the coupling. I don't want my users to be bounded to a specific functionality or a specific version of the API running. 
And I also don't want to expose what do I have in the back end to my front end. So this is one of the reasons why we should all go for REST APIs or APIs that completely decouple the implementation details from what people consume. And that's extremely, extremely important. We integrate several different services. We now have a computational reality far different from what we used to have. Does everyone agree that today with Amazon we just say plug in and build a couple of servers and there we go, we have a business in place. And we can have all these multiple devices as well that we need to support. Does anyone here build applications these days without having an API that runs well on your desktop or laptop and your iPad and mobile phone? That's not viable. If you go to any investor and they ask you, well, oh, your product seems good, does it run an iPhone? You say, no. What do you think will happen? Well, first of all, the guy will know, first of all, because you all know your true apps and all those things, but that's a different thing. Scale, we have a lot more data to treat. We have access to a lot of more data. For example, the firehosing API from Twitter, it allows you to get information from everyone immediately. You just need to have capacity to absorb all of that extreme information. We do a lot of different data than before. Nowadays, our application, we build it for something, and it evolves a lot, according with the audiences that we have, the kind of data that we manipulate, that, that kind of data that we integrate together. So this is extremely important to get us in a continuous cycle of improvement in our application. Obviously, we want to grow it. As much data as we have, the better we are positioned to give better service. And decoupling has a couple of very, very important reasons. It doesn't allow you to lock into certain specific features. It allows you to abstract all of that and give your end users or your applications a set of functionality that you guess can involve the back end and the front end completely separate, gives you more iterations. Also it comes in line with the new set of architecture that everyone is talking about, like microservices. It is super, super important that we have microservices in place so we can just start growing our systems independently from one component to another. This is extremely, extremely important. Also, it allows you to, to build faster, iterate as well faster. So, which APIs do we have? I'm going to find, slow me down, because I just had coffee and that was really good. <laughs> so, an API is a set of functionality that can be exposed by several different ways. Uh, you can have drivers that will expose you a certain API. Uh, Normally, we have 12 issue drivers and develop your application in there. Whatever system you want, C, Java, whatever, you will have an API for that ecosystem. But that's not what we are going to talk about today. We have different frameworks that expose MongoDB as a service. Any of those ones, like Dream Factory, Qlet, Mongo Java REST Server, REST Lake Art, they, these are all community services. These are all community libraries that expose MongoDB as an API. So you can just call it from an HTTP request and you operate with data. They will do a lot of things like validation of schema, enforcing a determined data types. They will do certain things that MongoDB doesn't do for you, but it might be useful for you to build faster. Give it a look. You also have some native uh, MongoDB APIs. I don't know if you guys know about this, but every time you boot up MongoDB, at least to version 2.6, you would immediately have a REST API. Does anyone, uh, and I'll show you that. We also have MMS and Ops Manager API, which is actually something very, very interesting if you want to deploy systems, if you want to have an idea how to build your systems in an interactive way. Does anyone ever done this before? Yeah, right? So, if I go to my system, and actually, I have it already running. Everyone can see this? Yeah. I have a set of them. Doesn't really matter which one it is, but I have this one here. I can put up. But I set it up with minus minus D, have API days, and rest. And what it gives me is an HTTP. REST API on port 28017. Yes, okay, 
long as it is. And it will just basically give me the status or some monitoring statistics of how the system is working. Now, this is bullshit. Okay? And we didn't have wanted this to be like a mainstream kind of thing yet. Well, first of all, in the, the database that is not just concerned in dealing with data, probably is wasting time and resources doing something else that it should be. So what the database should allow is you to build some kind of REST API that will map, collect all these metrics, either by some more decent protocol than HTTP to expose all this. For example, we have an SNMP correct connected. Right? Everyone knows what SNMP is. Yeah? So it's a way for you to get a sense of what the node is doing. We also have a couple of commands that we can emit, like MMS, that it collect all those commands and expose to you in a decent API. Okay? That you can graph, plot, all those things, and you have a visual impact of what is going on in one instance. It's quite cool, you know, you can have, you know, stuff like what's the status is looking like, which replica sets do we have, in this case none, which is the hosting information, all of this kind of be useful. I don't know if you guys know HiPython. Does anyone here know IPython? Does anyone here know Python at all? So for you guys that do know Python and you don't know IPython, you should be looking for it. It's the coolest thing ever. And IPython comes with one plugin which is called Notebook, which allows you to build stuff like the one that I'm going to be about to show you. So what I have here is just to show you how we can programmatically interact with that API that out of the box I'm going to be coming off of. This is all on GitHub, so we will be able to just browse through it, read it, just change it if you want to. But it simply just sets up a request library, I'm going to call my function, I'm going to parse the service status, and this is what I get. With this, I could immediately start building some kind of monitoring agent out of Python to check all my nodes, okay? And it does a lot of other things. Right. There you go. So I can just curl, let's get, get it. I can't do any posting, I can't, it's just a read-only API that's going to be offered. To be honest, you shouldn't use it that much because for testing, it's good to understand what is going on, but in production, you want your system to be just doing one thing, except for TCP requests, so data coming in, word is coming in, and results coming in. This is what a database should do, and this is what a database should be doing well. If it exposes an HTTP, HTTP REST API, great, but it's not really that awesome. So it's not extremely fancy, and you should just use it as reference. What we do have is an MMS Ops Manager. It's a tool that you can install either in your data center that can use Ops Manager, or you can plug it in using MMS. Some of you guys already use it, some of you guys know it a little bit. Let me show you how it works. Before, it operates in the following way. You will install an agent. That agent will collect a lot of data. Well, not a lot, but a few data. They will send back to a server, and that server will give you an exposed API, or there's no specific role when, once you work, you work for a startup. Once you work for a startup, everyone is everything. The guy next to you is a CEO, you are the CTO, or some kind of dude that pretends to do that, just fine. But you need to understand how your system are built, so you can integrate well with whatever you want to do. But if you're working for a large corporation, and I know a couple of you, so you know, I know that you talk to these guys, which is the sysadmin, and you will tell me, look, dude, I need this new application to monitor MongoDB plus. And the first reaction of the guy is going to be, no, get away, or I'll kill Because they already have a lot of systems that already have been implemented in the past, that already do that, not specifically on MongoDB, but actually do that for a lot of other components in your infrastructure. So the last thing you want to do is, overcharge these guys because they will kill you with another tool. So what we do is, we have your cluster, you install Ops Manager, and then you integrate it with all the tools that you have. For monitoring, for deployment, for all those things. Okay? 
How do we do that? Through the REST API. It's very well documented. I'm going to leave the uh, slides afterwards so you guys can uh, look for it. It is linkable and browsable, which is super important for any API that we build today. It's secure. It's extremely important that it has to be secure. Whitelisting and API keys. So you can you know, control it not just with a password. You can have your application ingest. Works splendidly. It's also rate limited. The last thing you want to do is having your monitoring system in a DDoS kind of attack, right? So add it up to your API, so the one that you are building. And obviously, it's restful. So it allows you to do anything that you want to do from those to get the patch well So before we recap, let me just show you what it does. So here, I just recently set it up. I can go for all of the, uh, um, here, I can go to all of the nodes that I have. I can have a primary. I can just plot everything that is going on with all of this metrics and connections and DB storage. Obviously, this is quite boring because I haven't done anything. I just started it up. But what the good thing that I can do with it is, let me show you that. I can build an API faster. I can build an API to control the interactions with it. If I have an Android, if I have an agent, or if I have HP Open View, or if I have any kind of other system that can request an HTTP invoke an HTTP request, I can integrate it completely with my underlying infrastructure. So what I'm doing here is basically, I'll start the connection to my API. I'm going to use my username for the, the system I'm controlling. This will be obviously the users of Ops Manager itself. I'm going to tell which host where it's running. In this case, it's running my chi. I need to tell it which application system I'm using, which is a HTTP digest. And then I can start operating. Now, there's a lot of uh, documented endpoints for all the documented for all the API endpoints that you have access to. What they can do, put, get, post, all of that is very well documented. This is also in the GitHub, so you can check it out. And this is the kind of re responses that I get. If I do a root access, which is basically API public view on, giving me the version I'm running. I can get immediately the links, and this is one of the coolest things that MongoDB REST API offers. It's a linkable and browsable API. If I get to an endpoint, I know where I can go next. I can have a transversible CT associated to any request that I do from that point to another. So here, for example, I can do two things. I can either have information on myself, the guy that is doing the requests, or I can have information on the groups that belong to this user. The groups is a, basically if I have seven clusters, I can have multiple accounts, and those are the MSN groups. Now, for each URL that I ask the API, you will ask, you will tell me a set of different ones. For example, if I iterate through all the different APIs that I can find on the links of one specific, I can then navigate for all vendors. And the results are the following. The first link, Go so here, I have the results of who am I, or oh, what's my cluster looking like. Here I'll have the information of my users. All of these things I can then pop up and keep on going as long as I have to go through a specific group to understand what's my cluster looking like. I can also ask the system how is my deployment looking like, if it's rich gold state, if everything is running okay. And this is just basically using this kind of systems and running on top. You can see here that I can get all sets of processes that are running, all sets of information I'm getting out of that I think, yeah. It gives you pretty replies out of the box. Well, it's just a setup. Nice to have. And obviously, I can also perform changes on the cluster. If I wanted to just run a change on a specific node and add another node to the reference or something like that, I could easily do that by just programmatically running it. 
Here, for example, I have the internal configuration. Using that configuration, which is quite long, it's quite long. I can then change the replication, have another member, send it back again. The system is immediately out of setup. As a couple application, it will give you scalability purposes. It will give you scalability uh, performance and horsepower. They allow integration with other different systems. You know, remember that guy that's saying no. Okay, that's you. You guys, if you run into sysadmin kind of role, you'll not want to have another tool to manage. You let the developers develop it, whatever they want. But you want them to integrate in what you do best. You should follow certain rules, like documenting it well. Okay? I know this is hard, this is hard work, but documentation is crucial to have a good integration, even within your own team members. Security is extremely important, versioning is still extremely important, and linking in discoverable systems are, in fact, a very, very nice way to extract a lot of the documentation. Just let people follow their path. Okay. Oh yes, and don't forget, uh, MongoDB is awesome, everyone knows that. And a lot of APIs that you guys are building probably are being built on top of MongoDB. And there's a couple of good reasons for that. First of all, iteratively, it's good, it's flexible, which is awesome, and allows you to expand and scale. For more info, just follow these links. The code will be available on GitHub. I'll provide all of this through the Twitter handler and through uh, the organizers of the conference. If you want to come to New York and uh, London first of uh, June, we're going to have an awesome conference there. Uh, you can have a discount code if you use my name on it. And I'll take you to all the coolest bars in New York because I'm going to be there. If you have any questions, please just submit it to me. And thank you so much.